to yet another episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel. My name is Chris Muir and I'm a product manager for Oracle Corporation. Now today's episode we're continuing on the architectural patents episodes from previous and we're discussing the two for one deal. Now the two for one deal pattern is a pattern that extends the sum of the parts pattern and essentially it's realized by the fact in the previous pattern, the sum of the parts, not only did we introduce bounded task flows but when we put them into BTF workspaces and then publish them via an ADS library jar that another workspace can consume, we've basically got a model for reuse coming into play. So in many ways, the two for one deal is just an extension of the sum of the parts. It's realizing one of the benefits, or one of the architectural advantages that we get from that particular pattern. So as typical, let's describe this now diagrammatically and then talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages. So let's consider this diagram. In this diagram, we have a number of bounded task flow workspaces down the center, and it's kind of similar to the sum of the parts pattern, where we have numerous bounded task flows, which may contain one to many bounded task flows. Now, at this stage, you may have built those already, you might be building some of those in the future, whichever, you would basically have a whole bunch of resources there that you can make use of. Now, you'll notice on the left-hand and right-hand side of this diagram, we have a master workspace, two master workspaces. In fact, you can think of those as two applications. Remember the master workspace or the composite workspace as such is the application that brings all the BTF workspaces together. In addition, which isn't shown in the diagram, would make use of the common workspace. But ultimately, the master workspace is the orchestrator. It's the guy that actually, in the end, contains the unbounded task flow and is the real application. Now, in the two-for-one deal architecture, we may have a situation where the first master workspace is actually dependent on the first bounded task flow workspace. Okay, so through an ADF library jar, it's published and consumed by that master workspace. In addition, you may have other bounded uh, task flow workspaces who obviously use their own ADF libraries, but at some point, you're going to have some bounded task flow workspaces that are reused by um, more than one master uh, application. Thus, the name two for one deal. Ultimately, we've got reuse coming into play here. That BTF workspace is being used by more than one application. It wasn't just built uh, for purpose for one workspace, it's been built for multiple workspaces to use and reuse its functionality with the benefits of reuse that come along. So when we go for the two for one deal, we're obviously saying that reuse is a major tenant in our overall application design. Okay, so reuse is something that you've decided upon that has to be you know, a strong requirement. You're not really saying, mm, reuse, yeah, whatever. You are going, no, no, we want to build bounded task flows that we can reuse across multiple applications. Now, one of the issues about reuse, and we'll use bounded task flows as an example, because we're talking about ADF applications here, is the issue of, well, now, you're not going to be building both applications at the same time. Well, it's very unlikely, right? Unless you're Oracle Corporation, where you have thousands of programmers, most organizations only have a set of developers who can build one application at a time. So you potentially have this broad requirement that between applications that you will reuse the bounded task flows. But the fact of the matter is, is you can only build one application at a time. So initially when you're building those reusable bounded task flows, their requirements are going to be driven by the first application. Though in time, of course, you want them to be adaptable to being reused by the second application. But the problem is, is that, hey, you don't have the requirements for the second application at this stage. How do you know that that bounded task flow that you've created, maybe it shows employees data, but maybe it shows employees data where some of the fields in one application have to be shown and another application, well, you just got to hide some of those fields. Now, how do you know that requirement's going to exist? Because you haven't started building that second application. Hey, maybe your business analysts, your users haven't even defined the requirements for it yet. So then you kind of need to sit there and think about, well, how will the workspace be, the BTFs be reused in the future? Can we add additional logic now, which we can predict will make it more reusable in the future? One common example, for instance, is a read-only flag on your BTFs to say, well, normally a banner task flow would allow you to view then edit employees, but maybe in the next application, you only want to provide the ability to view and go to a read-only form. So you have to include a parameter that allows the bounded task flow to switch between modes. So you could think about that. You could add these additional 
parameters, additional logic, additional flexibility into your banner task flows with the goal of when you actually get to the next application, everything's already done for you. And that's good. That's a great uh, you know, incentive to do this sort of things, but it is going to cost you effort. It's certainly not going to be an exercise of, well, well, you will just um, build in a few more parameters and it'll only take a couple of days. Sometimes building in all that um, additional reuse logic or that flexibility can cost considerable time. Now, if you multiply that effort across all your bounded task flows, you can imagine this effort is going to start to add up. And in addition, you've really got to put some keen design skills at play, or bring them into play, I should say, to work out how you're going to make those bounded task flows reusable. What is possibly the future application going to need in terms of functionality? So there's going to be a cost associated with this. Effort, brain power, design skills, and even additional code that you're going to have to maintain. And, of course, once you actually get to that next application, you may discover that all those bounded task flows, maybe you built 10 or 100, that mm, you only reuse 10% of them. So you've built in all this reusable logic, okay, all this additional flexible logic, but in the end, you didn't really need it. And now you've got a bit of an issue that A, you wasted a bunch of time, but B, you've got to support a whole bunch of code that's never really going to be reused. Mm. This is going to start to sound like a bit of a problem. But how do you know? How do you trade this off against reuse versus well, building everything for purpose and then realizing you don't have any flexibility in the future? I don't have an answer for you, but this is some of the design issues you're going to get into. And it's all driven by your initial requirement of reuse. If you put that requirement of reuse across all your applications, then you've got to have a broader mindset about how you're going to design your actual bounded task flows and those associated BTF workspaces. Another issue you'll get into, which I guess in a way is a kind of nice to have, but imagine you've got past your first application, past your second ADF application, now you're up to your 10th ADF application and you literally have hundreds of bounded task flow workspaces. Now if you look at the statistics for Oracle Fusion applications, they had thousands of bounded task flows for Fusion apps. So one day maybe you'll be as big as Fusion apps. Now, as you're considering that 10th ADF application or 11th ADF application, you still have this mindset of reuse and you're looking to your bounded task flow workspaces. But what happens when you have a requirement in front of you and you look at it and go, oh, we need a bounded task flow that does this. And you go and look at your list of bounded task flows and oops, you don't actually discover that you've already coded a bounded task flow once already. So what does your development team do? They go and build another one. Oops, this could happen. Why? Because at the moment, for at least JDeveloper, there's no tooling to assist you to understand all the different banner task flows and the associated banner task flow workspaces that you've created. The uh, analogy from the web service world is they have a concept called the UDDI registry where you can publish all your web services up into. Now, in JDeveloper, there is no such publication mechanism that you can then explore you need to basically keep track of this stuff yourself at this stage. So you can see kind of a bit of a problem there, maybe from the tooling perspective, but also from a design and architecture perspective, your ability to maintain and reuse all these banded task flows, well, you're probably going to need to keep some sort of clear documentation and have a few good team members who have a good idea of what exists already rather than rewriting things from the ground up. Let's then consider some of the advantages of the two-for-one deal. And really, the advantages of the two-for-one deal pattern are that of the sum of the parts. All that breaking up of the application into multiple components obviously gives us the ability to then reuse our bounded task flow workspaces and the associated bounded task flows across applications. Now, I know I've been slightly negative on the concepts of reuse, but reuse is still a good thing in computing. The fact that rather than having two copies of the same thing, where if you need to change one, you need to change them both places, maintain two copies of the code, maybe they get out of the sync. Having it only defined once and only having to fix something once in one place and then reusing it across different applications is a good thing. But reuse can be taken too far. And as we've seen, that concept of, well, reuse in the future, how do you design for future-proofing your banner task flows from a reuse perspective? This can become difficult an overhead and unnecessary if not all your uh, banner task flows are going to be used in the future. Let's then consider some disadvantages of the two-for-one deal. 
Now again, a lot of the disadvantages are just that of the some of the one uh, some of the parts architectural pattern. Okay, so look back to the previous episode to get some of those disadvantages. However, another disadvantage that comes into play much more strongly than the sum of the parts is that of dependency management and versioning. We made mention in the previous episode where you have a master workspace that is dependent on a bunch of BTF workspaces that is dependent on a common workspace in turn that you need to build, well, in fact, check out that code, build it and deploy it in the right order. And this becomes much more complex exercise from when we had just the patterns with one workspace. Now, while JDeveloper, the IDE, does allow you to track the dependencies between the different uh, application workspaces and their projects, in terms of checking out the code and doing the builds and putting them into a repository that other developers can access, well, this is something that JDeveloper doesn't do for you. So you're going to need tools to assist you to do that. And the issue of dependency management becomes much more complex when you bring in versioning. Now in the two for one deal, we have a scenario where you've got two master workspaces that are dependent on a bounded Tarsalo workspace. Okay, so the interesting thing about this is maybe application A and application B are currently dependent on version one of the BTF workspace. And the users of application A are so happy with their ADF application that they come along and say, oh great, could you give us this extra little feature in the BTF workspace? New being accommodating programmers and developers and architects and ADF officiados, you go, yeah, no worries, we'll build version two of the BTF workspace and make it available for version uh, application A, I should say. So at this stage, you've got application A version one using, well, in fact, it would be version two using version two of the BTF workspace. And maybe they need a fix, so then that ends up being application version three needs version two of the BTF workspace. But meanwhile, the previous or the other application, version one, application B that is, is still using version one of the BTF workspace. Now, you've got a bit of an issue because your choices are, well, upgrade application B to version two of the BTF workspace. But maybe you're not in an opportunity area or you don't work for an organization that will willingly let you do that straight off the bat. Maybe they'll force you to do a full regression test of application B with the new version of the Banner Tesla workspace. Now, some organizations I know, and I know you work for some of those organizations out there as well, that some organizations, when they regression test an application, they don't have any automated tools to do this. They actually sit a bunch of users, business analysts, programmers, down in a room and they manually go through the whole application with a bunch of test specifications and manually test the application. Now that takes a lot of effort. So from my own personal experience, I know at a lot of organizations that they don't do that like doing regression testing and that actually makes them not upgrade their applications. So here we were thinking about, oh, we just easily upgrade application B to version two of BTF workspace, but now we've got an issue where no, we've got to keep track of that the second application has an old version of the BTF workspace and the new application has a new version. And when we check the code out to build those applications, we've got to be very careful that we're actually checking out the right version of the BTF workspace for each application. Now it gets more complicated because, well, application A, mm, they find a bug in ADF. <laughs> bad for product managers to say that, but they find a bug in ADF and they suddenly realize they need to upgrade to a new version of JDeveloper. Now they happily do that, there's a new version of the application, a new version of the BTF workspace and they deploy it onto a new WebLogic server in order to install the ADF runtimes and run the application. But meanwhile, hmm, the second application, again, they don't want to regression test anything. So they leave it on that old version. And not only can you see here now we've got issues of ADF runtimes coming into play, but we need to track the ADF runtimes against the multiple applications and all the BTF workspaces. And oh, this is starting to get complicated. So this issue of reusable code and reusing across application workspaces isn't just an issue around design. It's now an issue around, well, building and deployment, our build orders, our versioning, oh, our infrastructure. We may need to bring in tools like Hudson or Jenkins, continuous integration service to help us build our applications in an automated fashion. And we may need to build in, uh, sorry, bring in tools like Apache Ivy and Apache Maven to help us solve the issue of dependency management, dependency management versioning, 
everything, all these additional types of software tools that most sophisticated software houses already have in house. But for some reason, a lot of ADF shops don't tend to have these tools in play, and this is their first exposure to them. You can see again, some manager, some user, some business analyst had a requirement of reuse, and everybody went, yeah, that makes a great idea. But when you get down to in terms of supporting this from a technical perspective, from a build or a DevOps perspective, suddenly you need tools and expertise in place that you may not have had before. And this is why picking the two for one deal pattern and some of the parts pattern, well, you can suddenly have a lot of infrastructure demands and skill demands by picking these particular patterns. Now again, you shouldn't shy away from this because a lot of software development houses out there, a lot of enterprises have these tools and have excessively adopted them. But that's not to say there isn't an associated cost. And architecture and design, it's often about not just your choices, but the cost of those choices. And that's why we bring it up here. So that concludes our look at the two for one deal pattern. Now in the next two episodes, we're going to look at the cylinder pattern and the pillar pattern, and these are actually reasonably good choices for large application developments. Again, we'll look at the pros and cons of them. They meet different requirements, but hopefully you'll stick with us in the next episodes to check out these two patterns because they're quite worthwhile learning about. So thanks again for your time on the ADF Architecture TV channel, and we hope to see you in the next episode very soon.